Hi, everyone. Hi. Welcome, welcome. We are about to kick off another webinar, so thank you for taking the time for joining us today. And just as a reminder, you can get your continuing education certificate um, at the end of the next business day by looking at your EdWeb transcript on the site. So you can always go to edweb.net code to join the community as well. And the community is a great place to, whoops, our lights keep turning off. Um, thank you. The community is a great place to connect with other like-minded educators like yourselves um, and kind of trade best secrets and best practices and learn from one another. So do check out our community at web.net slash code. And then just to give you a little bit of an introduction, um, my name again is Derry Stevens. I'm Director of Community Marketing here at Wonder Workshop. I'm a former educator. I taught for over 10 years. I taught sixth grade, fifth grade, and probably my favorite was third grade. Um, and then I've worked at many ed tech companies. I've always had a love for all things media related. I had a Down syndrome brother growing up and was always amazed, amazed at what he learned with the different learning styles and um, mediums and modalities. And um, I formerly led education content at Common Sense and then came over to Wonder Workshop and have fallen in love with everything coding and robotics. But I was a novice, I had very little background in it. And my name is Victoria Davila. I am originally from Mexico, but I've been living in um, San Francisco for 10 years now. Um, I'm an industrial designer. I specialized in toy design and I've always been drawn to education thanks to my, my mom ma mainly. Um, so, um, I've done anything from pet toys to like heavy mechanical designs, but this, once I landed here at Wonder Workshop, it became my huge passion to design toys for education, mainly robotics. I was also a novice in coding, um, but now I'm super passionate about it and, um, and I just, I'm the one that creates the magic here. <laughs> a lot of the fun stuff. Yeah, a lot of fun stuff. <laughs> So we're going to kick off today. Yes, we're talking about constructing a maker's mindset with DIY materials. Um, so for those of you who don't know, we are sharing uh, a document. You can either screenshot this or follow a link where you can see all the links and titles and resources that we're talking about so you don't have to like write them down throughout this webinar. And you can keep them and then talk about them later, maybe share them with your peers and or students. Uh, so first of all, we're going to start with um, the video. Yeah. First, we'd love to hear a little bit about yourself. So will you take a second in the chat and let us know your name and where you're from? Um, if you're an educator, maybe what your role is. If you're a parent, how old are your kids? Just helps us to get a sense of who our audience is and love seeing it from people from all over the world. Over. Yeah. Probably my mom's there. So hi, mom. <laughs> A lot of New Yorkers. Yeah. Ooh, recreational therapists. We have been hearing about Dash and Dot being used in um, hospitals. Oh, yeah. I did hear about that. Yeah. That's great. Library assistants. China. So fun to see. Yeah. It's so great to see everybody. Uh, Childcare provider. That's wonderful. School psychologist. I like that. It's exciting to see how. Um, you know, computer science is being embraced not just as like a supplemental subject, yeah. but really the principles are becoming foundational in all subject areas. A lot of school librarians. I know, I love it. Second grade teacher. So great. Yes. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. We will keep watching, but as you continue telling us a little about yourselves, um, I thought I would play a video, and this is one I just stumbled upon. It's actually a book trailer for I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly, Dean Kamer's Creating Innovation Book Launch. But what I really liked is that how it underscores the need for innovation um, quite nicely. I'm gonna switch over so you can see this video. And again, all these links are on that document that we linked to, and it will be in the archives as well. How important is innovation? How important is oxygen to life? If America doesn't produce high imagination people, we are going to be a very poor country. Raising um, someone with an intention that they'll be an innovator is actually different than raising a child 
um, that you want to behave all the time and be quite compliant. Some of the people that are the most rambunctious seem to sometimes have the best ideas. I want to feel like what I'm doing every day matters. Of course my guidance counselor told me to go straight to college. My dream manager might not have told me to do that. I came to Tulane because I really wanted to go to a university that was committed to public service. The philosophy of High Tech High is founded largely on the idea of kids making, doing, building, shaping, and inventing stuff. The MIT Media Lab spend far less time in formal classrooms learning theory and far more time on projects building things. Knowledge, in a sense, is a commodity. You can get this on Google. Uh, it's about asking the right questions. It's about having the right insights and perceptions. Let them fail because they're going to learn more from that than we could ever teach them directly. Our success is measured more or less by the rate of innovation. So I saw in the chat, Elizabeth said she had read the book. I have not yet, but it is in my Amazon cart. So that's <laughs> something I need to check out. Um, okay, back to slides. Yeah. So we're going to start this by, you know, the first question, what or who is a maker? So it is defined as someone who uses their skill set to create or produce. Um, a lot of people tend to put a label to it, but really it's anybody from like DIY, um, crafts to tech and code. If you're producing something, if you're creating something, using your skill set, you are a maker. Uh, I'm going to share one of my favorite quotes, and this is by Adam Savage. He's a designer and inventor, and he's better known for his um, show Mythbusters. He was one. He was in the show. And it says, humans do two things that make us unique from all other animals. We make tools and we tell stories. And when you make something, you're doing both at once. I love this quote because um, it gives you a better picture on what a maker mindset is, who a maker really is. Um, the world is full of things that were created by makers. Without makers, there would be no innovation and creation. I think this is super important to keep in mind because when we bring this to the classroom and we give this mindset to young people, um, have them think creatively, you give them the tools to make their own future. Uh, so this is a tech talk um, on, it is on We Are Makers, majority. He is the founder of Maker, uh, Make Magazine and Maker Fair. Uh, I've actually gone to Maker Fair since like 2010. I love it. I love the space. I love the people that um, participate in it. And he's actually the one that in 2013 coined the phrase maker education, uh, which emphasizes the idea of hands-on project-based learning. Check it out when you have a moment. We don't have time right now. <laughs> and this is another phrase that I really, really like, and it's kind of a meta a little bit tongue tied to you can't think about thinking without thinking about thinking about something and it's by Seymour uh, Papert yes and Seymour Papert so um, just to go a little academic on you <laughs> if you think back to your classes um, for education those of you that took them in either college or graduate school or some of the readings that you've done um, since then you may remember some of those that stand out when it comes to learning theory. So it could be Piaget or Dewey or Montessori. There's a host of names. But a lot of people haven't spent a lot of time looking at the more recent research that's come out. And two that stand out in the makers movement are Papert and Resnick. Papert, the gentleman on the left, um, is the father of Logo. So I'm aging myself, but you may remember Logo with the, the green turtle on the screen that mood where you do like FD10 and RT90. Um, and he basically took the idea of constructivism and he expanded on the notion with constructionism. So very slight dis difference, but constructivism to constructionism. And he put a focus on student-directed learning and participatory learning. And where it's where learners really rely on what they already know in order to discover and acquire new knowledge. Um, and constructivism gave kind of birth to this idea of, quote, learning by doing or learning by making. And it was really a shift from this transi 
transmissional model of learning to one where students are now creating and designing and constructing in order to build new knowledge, um, which is especially important in light of today's affordances of new technologies. Resnick, the gentleman on the right, was a student of Pepper's, and he's known as the father of the all popular Scratch. So I'm sure many of you have used Scratch in your classrooms or heard about it or seen kids create all sorts of wonderful things using Scratch. Um, he's still an integral player in um, MIT's Media Lab, which is a great resource to check out. Um, and these two fine researchers' work has really given the makers' movements its legs. You can see um, the quote, so technology, if used in the right way, has an opportunity to change what it is we learn. Similarly, technology can change how we learn. It's not just about delivering information, but learning through experimentation and exploration. And the video we just watched mentioned that. You can find all sorts of information on Google, but you have to know what questions to ask. And then let's begin with some of the good stuff, the skills that are associated with this like maker's mindset. Um, what are the benefits? And there are just so many. So this is actually an image that we created to underscore the multitude of skills that are learned through coding and robotics with all we do at Wonder Workshop. Um, but many of these same skills are similarly addressed in kind of the maker's movement. They range from academic to social emotional learning, to executive functioning, to interpersonal skills. Again, the benefits are many. And these, this kind of maker's mindset can affect how you approach pedagogy and methodology in your own classroom. So to kind of dive into a couple of them, think about SEL, social emotional learning. Um, we have this idea, you often hear in the makers movement, the mantra of fail fast and fail forward. Mm -hmm. And kids really learn this idea that they need to persevere and iterate and work together towards common goals and then to reflect and reset those goals. And they're all great mindsets for establishing lifelong learning habits of mind. Stanford professor Carol Dweck, you may be familiar with that name, recently um, had a lot of attention for her research on a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. She has a wonderful TED talk as well to look into when you have about, I think it's like 15 minutes long. Um, and then CASEL is an organization, if you don't know them, C-A-S-E-L.org. They are kind of the gurus on social emotional learning and they have a lot of free great resources um, that are helpful to you in the classroom. Another concrete connection to the makers movement is this idea of problem solving. There are so many foundational problem solving skills that are applicable across any and all subject areas. So if you think about the four C's that we talk about today, um, one of them being critical thinking, these are the skills such as analyzing and reasoning, um, evaluating, decision making, which I'm horrible at. Um, but these foundational skills really go far beyond the classroom and school. They're instrumental to like life skills um, and what you'll use in your the workplace and your personal life moving forward. So again, really foundational and a lot of them are underscored in, in maker projects um, across the board. Project-based learning, often called problem-based learning or more commonly known as PBL. So PBL can be kind of challenging to implement well into classrooms. It takes a shift in our own mindsets as educators to become that, you know, to move uh, move away from being that sage on the stage to that guide on the side. Um, you take on more of a facilitation role as groups of students work in teams on a real world problem that they've identified and that they're interested in. And they often work on these projects for weeks, even months at a time. Um, and again, if you need some more resources, the Buck Institute is great for PBL. But you'll find that a lot of what you're doing in maker spaces or with the maker movements tie so nicely to project-based learning. So again, it, you know, finding these concrete connections to what you're already doing or what you want to do will really help embrace this idea of makers in your classroom. Design thinking. Um, I have drunk the Kool-Aid on this one. So design thinking has a new following thanks in part to Stanford's D School, which is not an actual school. Um, and then the San Francisco San Francisco-based organization, although they have global offices, called IDEO, I-D-E-O. And design thinking has been around for years. Engineers and people like Victoria, <laughs> with her training in design, have 
always kind of embraced it, but we're seeing it taught explicitly now in elementary schools and beyond, where it's a hands-on approach to creative problem solving. Um, and it's a way to come to innovative solutions for kind of age old or nuanced problems. So the difference with what kind of the D school and IDEO have done is they've really put a human centered focus on it. And the first stage is all about empathy. So designers must begin with this empathy stage where they have to understand users needs before jumping to conclusions or coming up with solutions or working within kind of technological or economic restraints. Um, the D school often warns against the quote unquote cur curse of expertise. Um, you don't want to come in with that expertise. You want your users to tell you what they need or, or what they're encountering. Um, and you'll see in this, this graphic is a great one. It, this is the D schools. It really emphasizes and illustrates this iterative and fluid process of empathizing, defining, ideating, fancy word for brainstorming, prototyping, which is makerspace 101 right there, um, and then testing, and then circling back and iterating <laughs> over and over again um, to kind of hone your idea. And you'll see this, this annotated illustration is actually by Guido, who is the founder of Nearpod, which came, um, this project came out of the D School. Those of you that might be fans of them, as I am. And lastly, you know, these habits of minds apply across kind of other classroom practices. So system thinking, scientific process, inquiry-based learning. There are so many connections to what you're already doing. So think of embracing a maker's mindset as just expanding upon already your strong practices that you have in your classroom. So what is a makerspace? These are just some images we found online. There are so many blogs. I encourage you just to Google makerspace. So many teachers and educators have written about how they have made um, makerspaces or fabrication labs. They're often known as fab labs, which I love the name of, in their schools. Um, they have either redesigned classrooms or we're seeing a lot. They're taking computer labs or libraries and kind of redesigning them to be these multimedia lab spaces. Um, MIT's Center for Bits of Atoms, Bits and Atoms defines a fab lab as a technical prototyping platform for innovation and invention, providing stimulus for local entrepreneurship. It is also a platform for learning and innovation, a place to play, to create, to learn, to mentor, to invent. Makerspaces we know brings together kind of the best of education, engineering, um, fabrication and design, all of it has a real strong focus on collaboration, which again is one of those four C's um, for 21st century learning. And they really encompass kind of the old school practices of science labs and woodworking labs and art rooms, all with a modern twist of technology. But they really invite students to tinker and bring their ideas to life. Let me just show a short video on what is a makerspace. And again, we've We've shared all these links because these are great to share with your students. And again, what's so great about that kind of this mindset to me is this idea of failing forward and failing fast. Failing is a good thing. It is a good thing. Wasn't it Thomas Edison? He just found, he didn't fail. He found how many ways to not <laughs> create a light bulb. That is our maker space. So that's where we uh, build prototypes. We have a 
3D printing machine. We have a laser cutter, uh, a spray paint station, and then all the tools that we need to physically create the models ourselves. Um, lots of X-Acto knives and foam and just crazy materials over there. But um, that is our maker space. It's fun not being on the design team. We go by and often look in and be like, oh, what are they doing in there? And what's neat for you guys to think about, too, is a lot of this can be done with DIY materials. Um, the link we shared for the Stanford D School, the K-12 the K lab they have, you know, it's craft sticks and pipe cleaners and toilet paper tool ro uh, toilet paper rolls, um, paper and stickers. You'd be amazed what people can create with kind of fundamental, inexpensive materials. Um, yeah. There go our lights again. Uh, and, you know, because then if you're not investing a lot of time and a lot of money in a prototype or in an idea, you're more readily willing to give it up and iterate and change it if, if you haven't overly invested. So we know a lot of people maybe don't have the luxury of this space, dedicated space for um, making. This is a great example of um, just doing what you can with what you have. Uh, this is called the Spark Truck. It was created by Katie Crummick as a project for Stanford University. She converted an old delivery truck into a mobile maker space, and he, she would travel to schools uh, nationwide. When you have time, there is a movie about this. Check it out. It's really cool. Yeah. And if you don't have a truck, which a lot of us don't, <laughs> um, so classrooms have you know, carved out little spaces where they can to make a pro prototyping bins available for kids to tinker, and learn, and build. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, these are more of a DIY. They don't have to be very sophisticated. It's just a space to make, really. Um, there's also Make Space, a great book about reinventing traditional room designs by 2D school coaches. Um, there's also Stanford's D School, uh, which has a K through 12 lab with many resources and workshops available for free. And then we asked our Wonder Workshop educators to show what they have done in terms of storing and sharing robots. Um, and it was overwhelming the amount of photos we got that kind of the, these mobile maker spaces. So they took this idea of prototyping bins and then they married it with storage and sharing. And as you can see, they took a lot of old rolling carts. So these are library book carts or the old TV carts. Um, they put lips around them. A teacher I talked to this morning had like a cardboard box duct taped around, but I've seen people use pool noodles like as bumpers around the edge. Um, you can see at the photo on the left, they Velcro a power strip to the cart and then you can charge your robots overnight. So you have a mobile charging station. Um, and then a couple of folks have also added kind of add-on bins where you can put in Legos and kind of those DIY materials to inspire kids to create their own attachments too. So again, just a great way to share the goodness, both make it easy within your classroom and then across um, classrooms as well. I think I'm- Come on, by me. Yeah. Come on in. Hi. <laughs> See if I can orient us. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I'm just trying yeah. to get the camera. You need to go this way. No, I need to come towards yeah, you. Towards okay. Me. So close. So some great ideas for mobile maker spaces. And in that list of resources, um, we also, thank you, <laughs> put a blog article uh, to how to make these. So again, sharing great ideas from you guys in the field. And then remember, um, we're not suggesting that you have to go out and fundraise to make a maker space tomorrow. You have enough on your plates, we realize that. But hopefully we're just inspiring you that there are a lot of resources out there, a lot of free ones to kind of, again, inspire these maker mindsets in your students. Um, one way to start is to think of cardboard. And I say this, we were down at the Los Angeles Unified School District recently, um, and we worked with, I think it was almost 300 teachers over three days, and every teacher got a classroom set of robots and accessories, and those images at the top of the slide are the boxes from just one of the days. So I was just amazed at the amount of cardboard that these teachers had to 
go through, but also started thinking rapidly of what how they could use it. Um, the third grade teacher in me immediately thought of one of my favorite books, Not a Box, mm -hmm. that's on this um, slide. So there's your lit connection. But then thinking about how you could reuse these boxes to create mazes and obstacle courses and set designs. There's so much you can do with cardboard. Um, the picture on, below, we just shared a blog article with a Nearpod lesson. Caitlin Arkawa is a um, kindergarten teacher in California. She had shared this with her with us. She had her kindergarten kids recreate the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. So they mapped out the actual route on a grid on the floor. They took the cardboard boxes and made some skyscrapers through drawings um, and images they found on the computer. And then she had her kids write persuasive pieces on their balloon and float design ideas. She had them create them. And then they hosted their own parade with the robots parading down the course. I mean, check out the blog article in the video. It is one of the cutest things I have seen. Um, it's actually one of the main things that we use when we test robots with children. We take them to schools and they've built some amazing, amazing things with cardboards. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a blank slate. Yeah. And there's also a cardboard challenge. We, you can see the link here on the slide. Um, there's an official one that you can check out and participate in. And if you really, really, really want to be inspired, <laughs> check out this video. It's called um, Kane's Arcade. It's about a budding entrepreneur who created a whole arcade in his garage using just cardboard. Uh, he really is truly embodies what a maker's heart and mind is. Um, uh, it's a really wonderful video, so definitely check it out. Great one to share with your kids, too. Yes, very inspiring. Inspired me. <laughs> <laughs> There's also Rude Goldberg, uh, who is an illustrator and inventor. He was born in 1883, and he used to draw cartoons of what seemed to be like very simple tasks being ac accomplished in very complex series of steps. I don't know if you've seen it. Very basically putting it, it's like the domino effect, but you know when they start an action and it just kind of spreads into bigger mini uh, reactions, that was started by Ruth Goldberg. There are many cool videos, even world records set by this. Um, now his name is actually an adjective, an official adjective in, in the Merriam-Webster's dictionary where you can also host your own Hoop Goldberg challenges um, or join one of the many regional or national ones. If you happen to live in Pennsylvania, um, check out the local exhibits on this. Uh, we at Wonder Workshop embody this maker mindset fully, and we love seeing that inspired in how our users um, express that with our robots in their classrooms or in their clubs. Uh, this actually led to a very cool story on how our new accessory sketch kit was created. We start seeing a trend um, of videos posted and photos posted of people building mechanisms for Dash to draw. And we start seeing everywhere children figuring out their own ways to make Dash draw. And we thought to ourselves that would be a really cool product. So we took that idea to the sketchboard design thinking, we sketched it out. We created prototypes, we created renderings, as you can see in this next step. Um, some of the prototypes here, sometimes like hot glue and something that was already created, chopped off and, you know, just to kind of illustrate how it would work um, until we had a final product. You can see it right here, our sketch kit. Yeah. Uh, it actually won, it just won uh, best education product for elementary kids in 2018 by the Parents Pick Awards. And to think that it all started with makers in classrooms, just started people thinking about what they could do um, for the math babes. Very fun to see. Yeah. And like Victoria said, we try to embrace this mindset too um, here at Wonder Workshop. But one of the things I've seen done in classrooms, which is really fun, is this idea of a napkin manifesto. So very Silicon Valley. But the one on your side right here is actually from the Stanford D School, where they wrote down their guiding principles on a napkin. And you can see, prepare future innovators to be breakthrough thinkers and doers. Use design thinking to inspire interdisciplinary teams. Foster, I love this one, radical collaboration between students, faculty, and industry. Tackle big projects and use prototyping to discover new solutions. So something I've done when we've done some user testing and some workshops is, 
have your class or groups of students work in small groups to come up with their own napkin manifesto. What are the goals they have for this school year or what ideals do they want to embrace? And you can have them actually write them, just go borrow some napkins from like a Starbucks and then, and then you can post them around the room. And it's just a really clever and fun way to get that group buy-in to this idea that we want to be creative and innovative and iterative thinkers going forward. Okay, it looks like we have some time left and my video just restarted. Yeah, perfect. So if you have any questions, uh, I suggest you set them up up top. Um, you can also ask us through the chat. Um, yep, so there's a question mark you can add them to. We can see the chat right now. So if you have any specific ones, I did see a question at some point in the chat about lessons. We do have a lot of lessons online, so we offer a K-5 to curriculum for Dash and Dot, um, Learn to Code. It's all free. It's 30 lessons and six um, assessments. You can access them free online. Um, there are standard kind of 45, 50-minute lesson plans, um, and they have challenge cards that go with them, so they're great for working in small groups and then independent practice. We have a brand new curriculum for grades six to eight, it's called a plot for applied robotics. It's more of a project-based approach. So it's three different units. So you could do it in sixth grade, seventh, and eighth if you want. We've released unit one on creative writing and unit two on um, game design. Unit three is coming out by January on innovation. And students actually work in these really cool design notebooks in collaborative teams to work through projects that they're interested in. So again, all of that is online. And yes, the website, if you go to makewonder.com slash classroom, you will then see links to our curriculum. Also, we have two brand new online courses for you educators, professional um, learning courses. They are 12, about 12 hours long, and you can get a certificate at the end of them. But they really walk through the why of computer science before you get into the how. Why, why coding and robotics? Why this makerspace, project-based learning kind of methodology? Um, so we have a question from Catherine. I'd like to know more about the new curriculum for Q. Right. Okay. So three units. Two are released. Um, they come with lesson plans that, again, you can access online. You can check those out at makewonder.com slash classroom slash curriculum. Um, and you'll see the lesson plans. And then again, there are these companion student notebooks. I should have brought one in because they're really well designed. And kids can work in groups or individually um, and sketch out their ideas and work through kind of problems and solutions together. And that will help familiarize kids not only with Q and the features and functionality it has, but then also those basic coding concepts. So everything from sequencing all the way to functions and variables. Um, so those that you can access all online. We also have an online library of cross-curricular lessons and activities. Um, some are premium, but there are a whole bunch of free ones that you can go in and filter by grade and subject too, because that way you'll be able to see um, what matches your learning objectives. And again, it's makewonder.com slash classroom. Or if you just go to Make Wonder, then you'll see the tab for all our classroom materials. That answers the question, where can we find the lessons by Janelle Davila? Mm -hmm. um, again, those links have our bookmark, our archived, and you can also screenshot that right there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Patricia, desire to have makerspace, empty room. What would you do first? Ooh, I would first look at some of the blogs online of teachers who have already done it. Um, I did a lot of work with Stanford's Fab Lab, and they also have a bunch. It's one of the resources we listed. They have a bunch of kind of best practices. But it really depends on the dimensions of your space as to what kind of equipment you might want. It depends on what kind of... Um, funding you already have in place, or maybe what you need to do to raise certain funds. Sometimes Fab Labs go all the way, dive right in, and they go you know, for 3D printers and laser cutters and vinyl cutters and um, all sorts of kind of the fancier, more expensive equipment. Others really start with more of a DIY approach, and they do the prototyping bins and just have areas set up for kids to 
sketch and ideate and then build and glue and maybe some traditional woodworking materials, um, more kind of that hands-on construction piece. But there's no reason, again, why you can't dip your toes in and start small, either in your classroom or in such an empty space. We've also seen a lot of communities get involved. So parents um, having access to this room at your school, maybe they help donate through donorschoose.com. You could put up a list of desired resources or do a fundraiser towards equipment you're hoping for. But I've seen schools open up those rooms then, those maker spaces during the evenings or after schools where families can come in and work together on projects. And that way you get literally buy-in from the community on building out such a space. Uh, let's see, Catherine, is there anyone who can walk through how to use a new Q curriculum? So we do have, um, yes, <laughs> I'm just trying to think. We have some blog articles on the new curriculum. There was, there is an archived webinar on the new curriculum. But we will also be doing one probably in February timeframe after we release unit three, because at that point we'll have units one, two, and three, which obviously you can use throughout middle school. So I will ask our curriculum designer, um, Charlotte, to host one come February, and that way you can get a whole overview. But I do encourage you to just go on the site and start looking. And like I said, they're complete lesson plans. You can use them in their entirety, or you can pick and choose whatever is best for the approach with your kids. So Josh as, is asking about the address again. Um, Makewonder.com yes. slash classroom. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat too. Um, it can be a little confusing because it's not the name of our company, but makewonder.com will get you to all the good stuff. Patricia is asking self-contained classrooms. How would you encourage teachers to mm. utilize a makerspace? So that's where I think we're hoping, you know, maybe you lead by example and do some small things in your classroom environment because that's what you kind of have jurisdiction over. So is there a way to redesign your classroom space and carve out a corner similarly to have you maybe have done a library or um, an art corner and set up prototyping materials? And again, like Victoria was explaining, bins or shoe boxes or cubbies can contain yarn and masking tape and pipe cleaners. Um, and what I'm forgetting some of the basics. There's there's a whole list that the Stanford K-12 lab provides. Um, but again, you can send home uh, requests from parents and say, hey, look around and see what you have. Gather recyclable materials and turn them in once a week. I grew up in Boston and the Children's Museum there had a room when I was little where they had companies donate all their leftover widgets. So like the stuff that was punched out and left on the floor so you would walk in and there are these big containers like full of rubber stoppers and film canisters and just all these extra little pieces. And for a dollar, you fill up a brown stop and shop, you know, shopping bag and just take it home. And I always applauded my mother for letting us just bring home all this stuff. Um, but that's what you would create. Um, that's what we would create for hours. Again, just out of junk, you can get such great treasures. I usually end up going to Pinterest for ideas on how to store low budget. So, because um, I, I need my own maker space at home. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so starting small. Uh, so you definitely don't need a huge budget to do it. Just kind of get creative. Yeah. And the maker mindset. Exactly. And again, it's, you know, I think sometimes as students and as teachers, we like everything to be finished and polished. And that my, maker mindset is all about down and dirty and rough prototypes and not, you know, it's kids can come up with these, cardboard taped things and you kind of look at them going don't know what that is but the value is in the explanation and having a child talk you through their thought process and what they think they've created and what they're imagining so the actual prototype doesn't have to be functioning or working um, a lot of the work we did at Stanford on designing apps they were paper-based so we would use sticky notes to say this is the first screen here are the buttons which would you push and that's how we would do user testing all with paper there's no reason that you have to mock it up in any sort of fancy design um, applications. So again, low res really feeds into that idea of fail fast and fail forward. We have a question from Janelle Dagala. How did you decide to work with kids and how did you narrow down the ages of, for the robots? Do you want to go do first? You, you sure, do you, how we started as a company, do you think? Or 
personally? Yeah, well, the company, the story of the company is very, very interesting uh, because I just, I think it just feeds into what we've been talking about this whole time. Our uh, CEO, uh, Vikas, he noticed uh, opportunity for learning through his daughter. Yeah, he wanted to make sure that she was empowered to want to learn and empowered to create um, through coding in this particular <laughs> scenario. Um, yeah, and he started, you know, his daughter, I think, was around two, maybe at most at the time when he came up with the idea. Um, and he wanted to make sure that as a female that she had equal opportunity. But then he also noticed that a lot of the coding and robotics was kids didn't have opportunities until about high school or later. And by then they might have already found other interests and might not have been as open to coding and robotics. So he wanted to start it younger. So with Dash and Dot, the first robots, they did a lot of user testing with little kids, you know, age five and six. Um, and some of the things they found was if you look, get one here, you know, Dot, lights again. Um, Dot has the three, the three wheel base. And that was intentional versus having two wheels because when it was two wheels, both girls and boys equated it to being a car, or, sorry, four wheels was a car or a truck. Two wheels was like an animal or a human. So the three wheels really made it um, open to imagination. And they also covered, when the robot's on the ground, you don't really see the wheels. And again, that was to take away from kind of the truck and car association. Um, the one eye, again, made it less human-like, more alien-like to, again, let kids' imaginations lead the way. Um, so that user testing, that design thinking of really being human-centered and asking the questions and not making the assumptions about what kind of toys a kid has wanted, I think has really led to the success of Wonder Workshop. Um, so they started with younger kids. We've got older kids. We're looking at the full spectrum. And we also know that a lot of parents you know, kids of all ages uh, really enjoy playing with the robots. Um, Judith, do you know of any schools slash museums in the Hudson Valley, Valley area that have such ideas up and running? I don't off the top of my head. Um, do me a favor, uh, shoot me an email at support at Make Wonder with that question, because I can put you in touch with our outreach team because they're the ones that work with uh, schools across all the different states. So our Northeast regional manager would probably know of schools that have um, such spaces and, and have implemented such strategies successfully. In terms of museum, it's an interesting question. We've been talking to more and more museums. I had a conversation with one in Monterey recently, the Children's Creativity Museum here in San Francisco. And then what's the one in Seattle? Uh, there's a technology museum in Seattle that also yeah. They have exhibits of Dash and Dot and kind of these maker spaces um, that have really taken root and have proved popular in a museum setting. So it's neat, again, to see museums encouraging not just this look and see, but, you know, get in there and play and build and make. Actually, the Children's Creativity Museum was interesting because they had this whole project to create spaces for specifically for Dash. Um, so what they created for our robots was really interesting and how children interact with it and move it up and change it around. Um, it's really great. If you are in the area, definitely go and see it. Let's see, is the Q Middle School curriculum finished? No, February, right? Yeah, I think the third unit is coming out in Jan towards the end of January. I think we're slated around January 20th. So unit one and unit two are out and live. And actually, if you download, I would recommend everybody in middle school to go download the, um, the curriculum guide right now, which is on the site. You'll see a PDF download because when the third unit is released, the down, free download is going away um, because it will be a printed guide. So grab those, down, those curriculum guides right now. Um, but do dive in and check out units one and unit two. Unit one is all about creative writing with coding and robotics. Unit two is all about game design. Unit three, the one that's coming, will be very much in the same kind of vein and style, but it will be about innovation. Um, do you have any recommended resources for a high school makerspace library? We were talking about that. Some of the ones that we listed are on that uh, Google Docs file that we share. Yep. Uh -huh. um, and any other ones, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, there is a person that, um, 
Sherry, am I pronounced that correctly? Yep. She runs a makerspace. She's in California, and she wanted to see if she could post her handle as a resource since they've been doing a lot of projects, makerspace projects, including Dash Dot and Design Thinking. Definitely check her out. <laughs> yeah, please post Linking. your handle. <laughs> we would um, love, and Sherry, I will contact you about a blog article because we would love to, you know, the best the best advice we get are from teachers like yourselves that are um, experimenting and using our products in all different ways. So if you have found success with makerspaces and Dash and Dot, we, you know, we'd love to hear about it. Let's see, will these resources be available with the recording? Yep. So um, EdWeb has already, after this is done, you will be able to find the slides as well as the video and then as well as a PDF of the two pages of resource links. So we tried to make it easy for you guys so you didn't have to fast and furiously write down links. And the curriculum guides are where they can find them? So the K-5 to curriculum guide is for purchase. So that's in the store. But it is full of best practices. Um, answers to the challenge cards, room setup, um, reproducible pages, like worksheets that you can use to get kids thinking. And then on the curriculum page for six to eight, so again, if you go to makewonder.com slash classrooms, you'll see, you'll be guided to go to the curriculum pages. That's where you'll see the link for the downloadable curriculum guide. I'm looking through the messages now just to kind of catch some of the, the questions. Um, there was a, any field trips in New York City or Queens for students to do a hands-on demo? Uh, Not that I know of right now. New York City, though, um, if you're, uh, I don't know, was she saying, if you're part of New York City public schools, um, your SEP Junior group, which is part of the DOE, has cohorts every year. I think they're in their third cohort right now, and they use and do trainings on Dash and Dot. We've been I was just there in August helping with one of the trainings with New York City teachers. Um, and then NiceGate, the New York organization, also has resources and um, discounts for our online professional development course. Um, a lot of states do. If you go to teachwonder.com, I'm going to write this in. This is all about our PD courses. There are two of them, one for middle schoolers and one for um, elementary school teachers you can check out, um, but do see the partner pages because state partners discount greatly um, the course plus plus a robot. Yeah, I don't, if you have any more questions that I haven't uh, caught, uh, make sure you add them to the top bar. We have um, about 10 more minutes. We just yeah. wanna mention two other things and then we, we can stay on and answer any other questions. Yeah. So first of all, Hour of Code, as many of you know, it's coming up. Yeah, Hour of Code. Uh, check out all the free resources, the promotions, and our super fun Dancing with the Robots. Love the videos on those. Um, contests we have going out through the month of December. Uh, we have another free EdWeb webinar you can sign up for on December 3rd. Um, your complete guide to our code. So lots of kind of easy ways to get started with coding and robotics and then ways to continue past Hour of Code. Yeah. Um, one of which if we want to give a shout out to, if you're not familiar, Wonder Workshop holds an annual robotics competition. It's called the Wonder League Robotics Competition, WLRC. So this Wonder League is free to join and the competition, everything is done virtually. So you don't have to travel, you don't have to pay anything. But all we're asking you to do is to sign up teams of kids. A team can be one child up to five child, five child, five <laughs> children. Um, there are three different age brackets that the teams can participate in. So ages six to eight, 9 to 11, and our new group, 12 to 14, to bring Q into the mix. And basically, you're signing up to get all sorts of free materials to download. We offer five printable missions. These are creative problem-solving challenges that are team-based. Um, this year's theme is all under the sea, so everything takes place in the ocean. Um, <laughs> But they're really, they, they're scaffolded missions. They're a great way to introduce the robots to your kids. They're a great way to engage your kids in the robots time over time. We see teachers using them in class, in after school clubs. We've seen public libraries hosting um, the practice sessions on Saturdays. There's all different ways to do it. And the timeline is really flexible. We give a lot of support materials. Everything from sign up forms to posters, to stickers that you can print out, to certificates for the kids. Um, but you can sign up any from now until the end of the month 
to get the materials. Um, and then you can do as few or as many of the missions as you want. If you do participate in all five by the end of January, you will then um, be automatically enrolled into our invitational round when you submit your evidence that we ask for. And then the invitational round is one final mission in the month of March. And we award one $5,000 STEM grant grand prize to each of the age categories. So there's one grand prize for 6, 8, one for 9, 12, one for 12, 14. And again, this is free to enter, free to participate. You don't have to travel. Um, last year, we had over, I think it was 7,300 teams from 63 countries. So it's a great way for you guys as educators to connect with one another. We host a coach's corner um, on Edmodo where you can chat and ask questions and swap uh, best practices. But again, this year, it's our fourth year hosting this. This year's registration is open now until the end of December. So please join. And then let's see, any last questions? The teacher, teachteacher.com link. Oh, did I teach wonder? Yeah. www.teachwonder.com. And this is where you can see we came up with two online courses that are really designed for the beginning teacher who's brand new to coding and robotics. You know, kind of why are we teaching computer science? Um, because none of us grew up with that subject, or, or I'm aging myself again, um, <laughs> as a devoted subject. But, you know, we didn't grow up with it. We didn't have a model for it. So why are we now carving out time? Are there way? How do we do it without having to forego something else? How do we weave it into our everyday teaching um, in all we do? And it's six two-hour modules that you can work through at your own pace because it's an online self-guided course. You create Flipgrid videos and join a community to kind of reflect and ponder and ask questions. Um, you get a certificate at the end that you can use depending on your district and your state's parameters, but for continuing education credits. Um, and you can either buy just the course, the online course, or you can buy it with the robot. So it's a great way to kind of learn as you're doing. Um, and again, if you check out the partners pages, we have a lot of state partners that are offering the bundle of the robot in the course for a really significant discount. So again, one course is for elementary teachers and one is for um, middle school teachers. And we've seen teachers do it in cohorts. So it's online, they work at their own pace, but it would, you know, Victoria and I could do it at home at night and then meet the next day during lunch and talk about what we read and what we learned and what we watched and then go back and do the next module and come back together. So there's all different ways to kind of still tackle it in a collaborative manner. I think there was a question about the Wonder League um, that actually ties into this. Do you have another one for the other academic year? So we do this mm -hmm. every year, but we I would actually recommend that you do the one of our other products for the academic year and use this as more of a fun after school club. The, We've seen it, yeah, it's club. We've also now seen classroom teachers doing it. Um, they either carve out like maybe time on a Friday for an hour for teams. So they take their kit, their class of let's say 30 kids, split it into six teams. Um, everybody's working on a mission. The great thing about it is the solutions so vary. So there isn't just one solution. There are many ways to solve the missions. So it really allows kids to take autonomy um, and be really creative in how they're gonna problem solve. There are the five missions. It starts more easily and gets progressively harder. Um, you can, even though it's November, go ahead and register and, and access the materials now. When you register, you'll have access through the end of the year. So even if you don't want to participate in the invitation round, you can still use the materials within your class or your school. Um, a great example was Grand Blanc, Michigan last year. Jenna Hauser was an educator, is still an educator there. She stumbled upon um, the Wonder League and last year in year three decided to make it a district initiative. So they had all 600 fifth graders do the Wonder League missions. So all fifth graders broke out into teams across all the schools in Grand Blanc, Michigan. They all 600 t uh, kids did mission one and then they came up with their own kind of evaluation rubric 
and then advanced a, only a subset of kids to mission two, and then a smaller group to mission three, they actually did the final mission in person with families came and cheered the kids on. So they held their own kind of live version of the final and then awarded their own prizes and used our certificates. But it was really cool to see them take the materials yeah. and make it their own. Then a lot of their final teams submitted to participate in our invitational round and went on to compete for the $5,000 STEM grant grand prizes. Last year, um, our two, we only had two age brackets last year. We added a third this year for Q, but last year, ages six to eight, two girls won from Virginia. Um, they were on their local nightly news when they found out they won and they burst into tears. It's the cutest thing ever. <laughs> um, and four boys won in Massachusetts, in Newbury Park, Massachusetts for ages, uh, at that point it was nine to 12. So it was really neat to see. And the Code Crackers from Massachusetts had a sweet story in that they had such a brutal winter last year and a pipe broke in their school and the school had to shut down for the remainder of the school year and the kids had to go to different school sites to finish out the year. And the Wonder League was the thing that kept their kids working together because they had multiple teams. And then one of those teams actually ended up winning one of the grand prizes. So we recognize the top five teams in each age. So we'll actually recognize 15 teams this year, again, from across the globe. Um, but we will award the $5,000 STEM grant grand prizes to the top teams in each of the three age categories. So again, sign up, great materials for free, download and use whatever fits your schedule and your need. Okay, I think that's, that's about all the time that we have. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Thank you guys Thank for joining you. us. Um, we will hang out here for a couple more meetings or minutes in case there's anything else, but have a great rest of your day and do join us on the third for our complete guide to the hour of code all next week. It'll be a really fun week. Lots of activities. Yes. Thank you guys. Thank you.